Okay, hello. Uh, I have with me Colin Anderson. And um, could you briefly present yourself and the work that you're doing? Sure. Hello, Peter. Um, thanks for having me. My name is Colin. I'm a researcher at the Center for Agroecology, Water and Resilience at Coventry University in the UK. A lot of my work has um, kind of evolved around thinking about developing sustainable food systems in different territories, about policy, um, practice, how social movements engage, how science and academia can contribute to that shift towards more sustainable, just food systems. And so that work for me has spanned, started in North America, where I am from, and then has kind of moved over into Europe. And I've worked in India, amongst other places. Could you tell us a little bit about the dynamics regarding this issue? How have things evolved over the last years? Um, well, in regards to um, the agroecology, you, you're, you're, you mentioned that was you're kind of interested in having maybe a bit of the history of where that has come from. So, um, I mean, people talk about um, agroecology starting and it being used as a phrase like as early as in the 1920s in, in Russia and in Europe and Mexico. Um, in other places and kind of evolving over the years. And uh, when ag agroecology began, it was first kind of thought of as the application of ecological science to the design of agriculture or to the understanding of agriculture and eventually to the design of agricultural systems in order to develop a science of sustainable food systems. And over the years, that's evolved and grown and kind of, I think, become more dynamic and, and layered as um, people shifted more, less from thinking of just about in terms of the farm plot level and the, the production plot level to how these kind of principles of ecology and the principles of agroecology could be applied at a food systems level. And so the science of agroecology has kind of shifted from, from being something that's more around agronomy and ecology to something that involved the social sciences to involve thinking about not just um, academia, but how people's knowledge, how farmers' knowledge, how the knowledge of indigenous people can be combined in this transdisciplinary way to kind of make sense of agroecology. And then kind of fast forwarding is a quick kind of, um, it's a quick tour through the hi academic history of agroecology. More recently in the last 10 years, agroecology has been taken up. Um, I think in, not only in academia, but also pushed um, by social movements and civil society as this kind of alternative paradigm for food and farming, something that's much different from um, first from productivist agriculture, um, uh, which focuses primarily on almost exclusively on increasing yield and increasing profitability in short in a short term kind of mindset of agriculture to something that's far more holistic thinking about how um, an agroecological approach to designing not just f um, farms and food production systems but also entire food systems can be uh, adopted as a way to address many of the shortcomings of the industrial corporate food system the ecological social political and economic costs that we see and are threatening the the very uh, kind of foundations of, of the way uh, we feed ourselves and nurture ourselves in the world. So with that, um, agroecology is being taken up by kind of a, a, a growing, exponentially growing number of, of researchers and scientists, again, from across the spectrum, natural scientists, agronom agronomists, to foresters, to um, uh, social scientists, geographers, but also, again, people who are drawing people together in participatory research, drawing farmers and indigenous people, urban people together to think about how um, agroecological systems can be designed um, uh, together and how we can move this forward and transition from where we are to where we're going. So that's the academic side, but also really in an exciting way, agroecology is being taken up um, kind of globally by governments and by mainstream institutions like the food United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization has started to adopt agroecology. They've come off a five-year process of um, figuring out what agroecology means in different parts of uh, the the world and the different regions that they they focus on and then they launched the scaling up initiative and the, it's a really important kind of milestone in terms of the global governance of food and in terms of the the, the kind of the shifting discourses around food because they really work with lots of nation states to to try to incorporate and try to give advice and try to move things in a, in, in certain directions and so with agroecology being taken up by the FAO there are lots of kind of national government governments that are taking up agroecology in West Africa in India in uh, in Europe and um, it's really becoming introduced in a lot of the kind of national policies 
And then, of course, again, social movements have, have really been at the forefront of pushing agroecology and agroecology on the back side of that is the idea, or on, uh, I, it's like a flip side of the same coin, the idea of sovereignty. And so agroecology is not only a way to design food systems, but it's a way for people and people's movements and agricultural producers, indigenous people, to um, gain autonomy and to gain control over their food systems. And so it's a real kind of, um, it's not only a shift away from conventional agriculture and industrial corporate agriculture, but it's a shift away from some of the, the minor tweak kinds of solutions like climate smart agriculture and sustainable intensification, which largely leaves control over agriculture and decisions in agriculture in the hands of corporate actors, elite governments, um, and really kind of a technological approach and agroecology along with food sovereignty when you combine those together really focuses on political transformation as the basis for, for changing food systems. Thank you so much, uh, Colin, for this very brief and detailed analysis. Of course. Hi, boys. All right. So, Colin, would you say that um, this whole uh, <clears throat> agroecology um, approach is something that is more suitable uh, for the um, southern, uh, global south, uh, rather than in the global north, where already these kind of ideas of peasant agriculture, for instance, have been marginalized since at least 50 years. Um, how do you see the dynamics? I mean, for me, it, there are different starting points, different struggles, different problems. And so we have the idea of transitions and transforming um, wherever you come from towards an agroecological approach. So you, based on the principles and elements of agroecology, which I can send you some to share with your, your students. Um, IPES Food had a really nice report called From Uniformity to Diversity, um, indicating that agroecology is an approach that can be applied, whether it to be peasant agriculture in the global south or to um, kind of family farming and other forms of agriculture in the global north. I think in the, um, both, again, both places have their, their struggles in the global north. Of course, the industrialization of agriculture is far more um, kind of entrenched and, and historically um, pro progressed. But at the same time, it's not the only form of agriculture. There are lots of emerging and exi long existing forms of um, peasant agriculture, of alternative food networks, but also lots of people um, farming of, of small and medium size who are really pressured and who are really undermined by an industrial corporate food system and locked into a system. And so those, um, I think there are, is lots to be done in the global north and agriculture is completely applicable in the global north to think about how to transition from an in industrialized food system, which is kind of, again, really entrenched towards one that's more agroecological. It's a big task. There's lots to do there. There's lots to, to undo and to deconstruct, including um, issues around kind of land distribution, access to resources, the kind of markets that are available, the kind of um, policies and subsidy kind of um, programs, all of those things need to be transformed in um, places like Europe and Canada and Australia, um, the US in order to enable an agroecology. And to me, it's it's the only solution when you look at the, the problems that we what, that are ahead of us and the kind of looming threats around biodiversity loss, extinction, climate change. If we don't create these kind of make these massive changes, it's going to be really problematic. COVID illustrates how when motivated, we can make massive changes and we can, we can invest in the kinds of changes that need to happen. So that's the global north and the global south, a whole other set of problems. And again, this, this um, report from IPES Food um, talks about how in the global um, south, lots of the, the issue, you know, lots of the starting point is much different in lots of cases, although there is, there is the problem of the industrialization of agriculture, of land grabbing and larger land holdings creates a lot of issues around how to like roll out agroecology. But um, tr trying to think about how, um, well, in the global south and the colonized context and the relationship between the global north and the global south and all the things that have been done in terms of the traditional and ecological based food systems in the global south is massively problematic. And so you have a starting point where you have people who have been dispossessed, moved around, who have been, who have lost a lot of the basis of their their um, kind of traditional ecological food systems for a long time. 
So you have all of the, the effects of colonization and uh, the ongoing effects of col colonial relationship with the global north that you have to think about and how development plays a role in that. But also um, lots of potential because again, the industrialization of agriculture in the global south is far less. The, the kind of like hooks of corporate agriculture on, agri on agriculture in the global south are less and really strong peasant movements and movements of, of people behind the kind of food sovereignty and agroecology movement. But at the same time, there are lots of threats because you have um, uh, philanthropic donors and governments coming in and pushing corporate green revolution technologies onto the global south in ways that that kind of undermine the potential of agroecology and subsidies for fertilizers and subsidies for, and the, the kind of imposition of American technologies and European technologies in ways again that undermine agroecology and then a lot of a lot of kind of um, false claims about what agroecology is is trying to do in the global south like um, go backwards in time to and to to, to um, rob the the kind of options available to farmers and to to people in the global south so there's a lot of challenges but to me um i mean the your the fundament or the first question was is it applicable in both places yes of course but different pathways different starting points and lots of different um kind of issues to make sense of and there again there's some nice literature uh, or that could be kind of like the ipas food report that could help them your students make sense of that Thank you so much, Colin, for this information and uh, my best wishes to Ontario. No, to uh, Oregon. <laughs> You're welcome, Peter. Thank you. I'll just stop the recording. Mm -hmm. Jack.